a day that's going to be one of these days when God says it's over and he calls us home either by death or by rapture. Sister Nancy's going to come and sing about that at this time. God bless you. God bless you, sister. former things are passed away we find in the word of God in the book of Revelations. Open your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. 
1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 29 through 51, we'll be reading. The message this morning is there not a cause, cause the battle is the Lord's. Is there not a cause, cause the battle is the Lord's. Enjoy the quartet now as they come. says that when we get home, what a morning and what a day that's going to be, because it's eternal day. It says in the Word of God in the book of Revelations that there will be no more night. So when we sing what a morning when we get home, what a day that will be throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, it's just going to be one great day. Book of First Samuel 17, begin reading in verse 29. As we come to this text, let me just give you a little preface of this. As we come to this text, we find the armies of, Je of, of Israel, the armies of Jehovah God, were standing on one hillside. And over on the other hillside, with a valley in the middle, which we could call the Valley of Decision, was the armies of the Philistines, the armies of Satan, which always opposes God and his people. They were standing on the other hillside. The army of the Philistines was challenging the armies of God and inviting them and prodding them to do battle. You see, that's the way the devil always is. He's always prodding us. He always is inviting us to do battle. 
Why? Hoping to capture and kill the followers of God. But also we find at this particular text that the armies of Israel were afraid. They were scared. They were allowing self-defeat to enter in. And they were having a hard time finding somebody to go up against that great big demonic-led, demonic-filled man called Goliath, the champion of evil, the champion of the Philistines, Satan's champion. And so, as we begin to read, enters a little shepherd boy by the name of David. Look with me in verse 29. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him to another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again in the, same, in the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed or they told him to, before Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let not man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, I like this conversation. Thy servant has kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took out a lamb from the flock. And I went after him and I smote him and I delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. And the servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. I like his guts. Let me put it that way. I like his determination. I like his stand for Jehovah God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul answered, uh, armed David with his armor and put on him a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. He said, I can't go. I've got to prove this. I've got to see if it works. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. By the fact, that's the army of the world. That's what the world would like for you to be dressed in. We'll find out what God wants his people to be dressed in in just a little bit, the armor we use. And he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook and he put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistines. Let me just insert one thing. Do you know why he chose five smooth stones? Because Goliath had four brothers. You'll find later as you study the book of 1 Samuel, those four brothers had to be slain as well. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David, and the man that bare his shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and he saw David, he disdained him. And he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. They went down into the valley of decision. And David says, let's fight, because I'm on the Lord's side. To disdain means to look down upon with contempt as if they were nothing. And I say to you this morning that that's what the world, or that's how the world looks, and that's what the world thinks of the church of the living God. And at verse 43, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest with me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me. And I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, listen at this. Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come unto thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. 
This day will the Lord deliver me into deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thine head from thee, and I will give it to the car, give thy carcasses of the host of Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Amen. Amen. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the spear, sword or spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and, I, and he will give you into my hand. And if you read on, you'll find that David took that little smooth stone, placed it in his sling, wound it up a few times and let it go, and it sank into the forehead of that Philistine, that Goliath. He fell down, and David, not having a sword of his own, ran upon him, seized his sword, and cut his head off, and took it back and held it up to the glory of God. The devil's been defeated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the fact that we can be in your house today, that we are here. And Lord, we know, dear God, this morning that the battle is raging around us. And Father, Lord, we ask for your power. We ask for your leadership and your guidance as this message is preached this morning. May it be an encouragement to the saints of God that are gathered here May, Lord, the church of the redeemed be edified and lifted up, and may God be glorified in all that's done. If there's any that doesn't know you as their Savior, may the, today be the day of salvation that would, they'd come to you. If any here this morning are not in the battle for the right, and, Lord, they're saved but not waging a battle, not fighting for your glory, may they fall out of love with self and sin and fall back in love with Jesus and engage in the battle, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Look with me in verse 47. And all this assembly shall know that the, that the Lord saveth not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hand. As we look at this text, as we do with most texts, there are always two ways of handling a, handling a doctrinal teaching. One way that some folks choose to do it is to use it as an excuse to avoid committing oneself to the task or to faithfulness for God. The other is to use it for energy to do all that you can for God. That's the two ways you look at it most any text. Some look at this text as it said, since the battle is the Lord's, we are excused from fighting. That's just like saying since the harvest is the Lord's, we don't need to reap or we don't need to sow and reap and water the harvest. But let's see how David, or let's, we do see how David looked at this truth and he used this truth to, fight, to fire his soul, to energize himself and to strengthen his arm for the task that lie, laid before him. Beloved, today, today we're all battling on one side or the other. One side or the other, you're on. You're either on God's side or the devil's side. One of the two. There's no middle ground. And the worst of all are for those, those who, are, who boast of their neutrality, who don't see a need to fight even though they claim to be Christian believers. Well, I'm saved. That's all I need to do. Well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. There's no use me doing anything else. What a pitiful excuse for a believer. We the church, listen to this. We the church, you and I, and the church universal, are battling for the souls of men to re rescue them from Satan's control. We are battling for the righteousness of our country, which has been taken captive by Satan and his forces. But to the Christian believer, these words, the battle is the Lord's, are so true that they should be written upon the banner of our hearts. When you and I, who are engaged in the army of God, fighting for right, truth, and justice, our banner should say, the battle is the Lord's. What we're saying is, He's the one that's doing the fighting. So let's look in these find some truths in this text that will help us today. First of all, we see the great fact that the battle is the Lord's. Look in verse 47. And all this, this assemble shall know 
that the Lord saveth not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's. That's the fact of the matter. The battle is the Lord's. We belong to Him. We are in His army. You see, the battle is the, is the Lord's, for inasmuch as it is for truth, righteousness, holiness, and love, these are the things that the Lord loves, and this is the battle of the Lord's that He is choosing to fight. We find the psalmist writes in Psalms 45, 4, In thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth, meekness, and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. May I say to you this morning that you and I who are saved by God's grace, washed in God's blood, cleansed by God's word, kept by God's power, are engaged in a battle every day of our life. For some way, somehow. It's been said that if you haven't just come out of a battle, lift up your heads and look before you because you're getting ready to go into a battle. But before, you, uh, before we leave here today, we're going to understand that Christians fight from the stance of victory, not from the stance of defeat. You see, the Lord rides in His majesty. The Lord rides in His majesty. In other words, the Lord rules and reigns in the hearts of His people because of righteousness and holiness and truth and love. Yes, the battle's the Lord's. We find that the battle is the Lord's because God's name and glory is the object of the battle. God's name and glory is the object of the battle. It is His army, to, it is His honor to see the righteousness established upon this earth and in this nation and in this community. The gospel of grace glorifies God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Satan and his followers do all that they can to strike at his divine army when they oppose it. But wait a minute. That's not the end of the story. You see, but God will vindicate his own name, thereby the battle is the Lord's. Listen as Isaiah writes in chapter 40, verse 3 through 5. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall think shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. I'm going to tell you this morning, dear believer, dear church, uh, faithful church member, dear person in the family of God, we are here today to do battle for the name of God, for the glory of God. All that we do in this life, all that we ever do in this life as this church, in this community, as individual believers, should be to exalt and glorify our God. If we're here for any other reason, we're here for the wrong reason. And the battle is the Lord's that we fight. Because we fight not by our own power, but we fight only by His power. The Holy Ghost is our strength, and we can do nothing without the Lord. Thus the Lord, the battle is the Lord's to the highest degree. He tells us in 2 Chronicles 13, 12, And behold, God Himself is with us for our captain, and His priest with the sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you. I'm going to tell you this morning as we walk through this sinful world, as we live in this sinful nation that has forgotten God, that has turned its back on God, as we walk through this world with people and churches that are supposed to be followers of God, that are not faithful to Him, that do not live for Him, I'm going to tell you this morning that we fight not on our own and we don't have the leadership of our own, but I'm proud to say this morning that the Word of God, that God tells me and you and all the armies of God that He is our captain and He goes before us and if he goes before us there is nothing but victory to be had because he fights ahead of us in 2 Corinthians 20 12 our God will not judge that will not judge them for we have fought not might against the, this great company that cometh against us neither know we that but our eyes are upon thee I'm going to tell you as we walk through this world of sin and sorrow, as we walk through this world of hurt and trouble and trials, uh, we need to never forget to keep our eyes on God because He's our captive. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Holy Spirit is our empower. The Word of God is our guide. Keep your eyes on Jesus and we'll never fail. 
Fourthly, the battle is the Lord's. But it is God Himself who has commissioned us to fight. Christian believers are not freelance warriors. We're not freelance fighters. We don't fight for our own cause. We don't fight for money. We don't fight for glory. We don't fight for fame. But we fight as holy warriors under the command of our holy God. He commissions us to fight. Paul writes in, in 1 Timothy 6, 12, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou also wast called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. You say, preacher, what is the fight that we're fighting? It's a fight of faith. It's a good fight of faith. It says this, that we have declared ourselves to be sinners. But Jesus, when we believe, declared us to be saints. It says that we declared ourselves to be nothing. But Jesus, when He saved us, declared us to be His children, His followers, His, followers, his believers. It says that we declared ourselves to be members of the family of satanic control, fighters of darkness of this world. But when Jesus Christ reached down that long arm of love, picked us up out of the darkness of the kingdom of Satan, out of the miry clay, washed us in His own blood, planted us on the solid rock of Himself, and made us partakers of the armies of God, fighting the good fight of faith that others may know that He is our God and He lives and rules and reigns supremely. Amen. Fifthly, God Himself has bound Himself to fight with us in this battle for right. You say, what do you mean he's bound himself? He gave us his son, his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. He bound himself to us when he sent Jesus to the cross. He bound him, us to himself when he raised him from the dead. And boy, I tell you, like, like this, He gave it to us the covenant of grace. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. He says, I'm going to tell you what grace will do for you. It will surround you completely. You stand in grace. I'm going to tell you, I have such a covenant of grace that I can't walk forward and get out of it. I can't go backwards and get out of it. I can't go to the right and get out of it. I can't go to the left and get out of it. I can't go far enough beneath the ground to get out of it. And I can get in a rocket ship and go to the sky and I still can't get out of the surrounding covenant of the grace of God. God's grace is sufficient at all times for all things for all people to all those who believe I'm so, so thankful that God has given us the grace Amen. thereby we live Amen. but not only did he give us his only begotten son not only did he give us the covenant of grace but he has given us our, his word as our road map in this battle as our Amen. fighting plan let me put it that way our fighting plan and then dearly beloved He's given us a spiritual armor in which we fight with. You see, Saul took David into his, into his palace. He said, David, you can't go fighting the way you look. you just a little run, runny, a ruddish little boy. I mean, you're scrawny. That's basically what he was saying. You're not able to fight against that giant. And he wasn't out of his own power. So Saul says, come here, David. Here's my helmet. And he put it on his head. And that helmet probably just swallowed that little guy's head up. He said, here's my coat of armor, my coat of mail. And he put it on him. And he was so small that it probably weighed him down and he couldn't hardly walk. He says, here's my shield. And it was probably so heavy that he couldn't carry it. He said, here's my spear. And it was probably so long and weighted that he couldn't throw it. And David says, wait a minute. Saul, I'm not fighting for you, so I don't need your armor. You see, I'm not fighting for Israel. I don't need your armor. I'm not fighting for this world. I don't need your armor. It's no good. He says, you see, for I'm fighting for God. Matter of fact, I'm fighting with God. 
and his armor is all I need. So he took his little sling and his little bag and he went down to the to the stream and he picked up five smooth stones. He put it on and, and he looked up at God and he says, God, this is not my battle, but your battle. Now I'm going to walk down in that valley in a minute and you are going to kill the giant. Well, let me tell you something, folks. God didn't give us armor of this world to fight with. God doesn't give us armor of flesh and armor of this world to battle with. But he tells us in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. First thing we need to do is realize the battle is the Lord's. It's not ours, so we don't need our strength. The battle is the Lord's. Be strong in the might and in the power of his might. In the power of God's might. Put on the whole armor of God. That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Who are we fighting? The devil. Matter of fact, let me stop right here in just a moment. Do you remember who had, had you captive one day? It was the devil. But some old armor of or some, some old soldier of God, some faithful soldier of God, marching in the army of God, came to you with the message of grace came to you fighting the forces of hell that had captured you, told you about the marvelous grace of God, the covenant of grace, the power of God to take you out of sin and, and save you and make you a saint. It was because He was doing battle on your behalf that you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of, of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. That's today, by the way. And having to done all to stand, stand. Keep standing. Stand therefore, having, girt, girded, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the blessed, blessed prayer of righteousness, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby you will be able to quench the fairy darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all power and supplication in the Spirit, and watching with thereunto with all perseverance for the supplication of the saints. He says, children, I've invited you to fight and you've joined the army. We have a great battle ahead of us to defeat Satan and his foes. Get dressed. Get dressed. Get dressed. Dress yourself. Gird your loins with truth. What's truth? Jesus. The Word of God. The truth is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The truth is that He will save all that comes to Him by Jesus Christ. The truth is that all men have sinned, that all have come short of the glory of God. The truth is there is none righteous, no, not one. But the truth is that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Put on the blessed breastplate of righteousness. Hey, cover yourself with the righteousness of God. Shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Know how you got saved and how others come to know Jesus is by the gospel of peace. Take the shield of faith. What's that? My trust in Jesus. My trust in Jesus. That you might be able to quench the fairy darts of the wicked one. You see, the devil shoots darts at us all the time, every day of our life. And we take that, that shield of faith and we hold it up in front of us and we say, devil, shoot all you want, but you can't penetrate my faith because it's the faith of Jesus Christ. Put on the helmet of salvation. Hey, I'm saved by grace, kept by His power, washed in His blood, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hey, carry this Word everywhere you go. You should never be... You should never be less the Word of God. Why? Because you ought to hide it in your heart. That's what the psalmist says. If you hide it in your heart, it'll always be with you. And watch and pray.
because the devil as a roaring lion is walking about seeking whom he may devour. Be ready, always on guard to fight. And the day is coming. Listen to this, I love this. And the day is coming as promised by God Himself when the evil and wickedness will be destroyed. He tells us in Romans 6.20, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. We find in Revelations 20.10, the end of, uh, uh, end of all of this, the devil that deceit, deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hey, who wins the battle? The battle is the Lord's, but victory is ours. And because the battle is the Lord's, it will be fully won, or may I say it is fully won at Calvary. And all glory and all honor belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ and to Him alone. Psalmist David in Psalms 98 wrote this, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for He hath done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm hath gotten Him the victory. Amen? The Lord hath made known His salvation. His righteousness hath He opened, openly showed in the sight of all the heathen. He hath remembered His mercy and His truth toward the house of Israel. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. And then we move over to the book of Revelations, chapter 5. We find this words. And they sung a new song. I love this. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of, out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. You see, we know the end of the story. We know that victory is ours through Jesus Christ. We'll be singing that new song. Matter of fact, we ought to start singing that new song now. You see, the church with Jehovah as our God, Christ as our Redeemer, Holy Spirit as our guide, the Bible as our battle plan, will advance against the gates of hell as Jesus Christ said in Matthew 16, 18, when he said upon this, when he said this, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is victorious and triumphant, and one day, thanks be unto God, which give us us the victory, we're going to march into that glorious city of God, down that street of gold, right to the throne of God, and the church victorious will have victory forever, ever and ever throughout the ceaseless ages of time. If you know that this is true, church, give God praise and glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, listen, we saw the fact that the battle is the Lord's and why you and I need to be fighting and how you and I need to be fighting. But let me just say this, if we know the fact that the battle is the Lord's, we can look on it with a different mindset than the world. Let's look at our mindset as believers fighting the battle for the Lord. Because the battle is the Lord's. Christ is our captain that goes before us. He won the victory at Calvary. We can make light of our opposition. We can make light of our opposition. We can make light to the opposition. Who can stand against the Lord? When the devil comes to you, when the devil starts giving you a rough time and when your battle is raging, you can look at Mr. Devil and say, go home. Go home. You see... You can't fight against me because God's fighting for me. You can't defeat me because you're nothing and Christ is everything. 
You can't defeat me because I've been captured by love. I've been captured by grace. I've been saved by God's mercy. I've been washed in God's blood. Devil, you once had me. Never, no more, forever will you ever have me. I belong to Jesus. Amen. Nahum says in 1.6, Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. Devil, you're defeated. Your future is fire and brimstone. Oh, I thought about this this week. When the devil comes at you, when the devil begins to bark at you, and when the devil begins to try to feed you and wage war against you, say, my future is heaven, yours is hell. Go home. Because the battle is the Lord. We're not cowered by weakness. We're not cowered by weakness. You see, for the word of God says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. When I am weak, I am in strong. The Lord will make us mighty to his battle. The Lord will make us mighty for his battle. We find the word of God says in 1 John 4, 4, ye are, the, uh, ye are of God, little children. I like that. Ye are of God, no more of the devil. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Who? The wicked ones. Now how did we overcome them? How do we overcome them that time? How do we overcome them every day of our life and every day of our life yet to come? Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You see, there was a time in our life that we were taken captive by the devil. He was our God. He was our Lord. He, was, he had enthroned himself in our heart. But the word of God says that if we confess, our, if we confess the Lord Jesus, if we confess the Lord Jesus, if we confess him as our Lord, Believe when thy heart, confess with thy mouth, thou shalt be saved. There was a time when the devil lived here. God came in because we said, welcome Jesus. Holy Spirit moved in, cleaned us up by the word of God from the inside out, by the way. Enthroned himself as the, in, there. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of the living God. And every now the devil comes and wants back in. And we just tell him the throne belongs to Jesus. Go home. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You see, because the battle is the Lord's and we fight from victory, we can throw ourselves into the battle or his work heartily. We owe so much to the Lord Jesus Christ that we must fight for him. We must. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on salvation. Fight that good fight of faith. You see, what He's done for us should cause us to want to be faithful in all avenues of service. To want to be faithful in the fight. To want to be doing everything that He's asked us to do. Everything He's instructed, instructed us to do. And we do it heartily. Wholeheartedly. We do it with joy and gladness. We do it because He loved us and we love Him because He loved us. We do it not because of us, but because He loved us and gave Himself for us on the cross of Calvary. And listen, since the battle is the Lord's, we can fight with all of our heart and all of our might because He makes us strong and He lives within us. And he has given us the best welcome, best weapons. Now I want you to listen to this. He's given us the best weapons. He's given us love, truth, zeal, power, patience, because all these are best in the battle for the Lord. You see, the world uses everything else. It uses hatred. It uses racism. It uses worldly things. It uses the things of the devil. It uses things to tear down and not build up. But God and His followers, the Christian believers, use love, truth, zeal, prayer, and patience. 
There are those religions around us that demands that their people kill all non-believers of their, of their belief. You see what Jesus Christ says for us to do as His army is to go forth into the world of infidels and unbelievers and preach the message that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. We ought to take the weapons of love and love those that are unlovable. Do you remember when you were unlovable? I remember when I was unlovable. We need to take the weapon of love and say God loves you. We need to take the truth of the Word of God and say to you, Jesus Christ is truth. And if the truth, if you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. We need to take the, the, the weapon of zeal, never cowered behind, but would be zealous, zealous workers and, and go on for God, saying, I can't do enough for him. We need to take the weapon of prayer and pray for those who know Him not. Pray for those that need Him. We need to take the weapon of patience and love those people who are unlovable. Pray for those who need Him and patiently wait on them to come to Jesus. Because we find out in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but are mighty, to, uh, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. May I say to you this morning that we as the mighty of God are a great and mighty army. A great and mighty army. But we are an army of peace, not of, not of, of hate. We are an army of the love of God, not of things that will hurt and destroy. And our mindset ought to be that of victory because we are assured of victory by Christ. Listen at this. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 and 58. But thanks be unto God, which give us us the victory through Jesus Christ, Christ, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see, we work because Jesus won the victory. We have victory because He won it at Calvary. We fight the battle of faith, the good fight of faith. We go out into this world that's controlled by satanic powers. We go out in this world of darkness by, by demonic powers. Uh, spirits but we go out taking the word of God which is the sword of the spirit we go out taking the message of the good gospel of Jesus Christ which is the saving grace uh, we go out and tell people about his mercy and his love because that's what will bring them to Jesus know ye not that it is the love of God that bringeth men to repentance uh, we don't need to go out and fight a fight of hatred with a bad attitude and saying hey listen if you died today do you know you'd split, split hell wide open no, we need to go today and say Jesus Christ loved you so much that He came to this earth, took on the form of flesh, endured all the afflictions that we did, went to the cross of Calvary, died a vicarious death, and loved you so much that He'll love you right into heaven if you'll take Him as your Savior. Because the battle is the Lord's. And victory is certain. We can do battle against Satan and his wickedness with the right frame of mind. Church, give Him praise and glory. Amen. Thirdly, this morning, we sing the battle is the Lord's. How we can fight and how we should fight. We sing because the battle of the Lord's is we can have the right frame of mind as we work in His kingdom, as we fight within His army. But thirdly, there's some lessons there are some lessons that we can live by since we know the battle is the Lord's. David said to those who are around him, what have I done? Is there not a cause? Beloved, there's a cause. There's a cause. Because the battle is the Lord's. Because our loved ones are dying and going to hell. Because our friends and neighbors are dying and going to hell. Because our nation is corrupt. Because our leadership don't love God. Because this nation of political power hates the power of God. Because this nation is, is headed, headed to a great and drastic fall if people don't come back to Jesus. There's a cause because we need to get out and tell men, women, and boys and girls about Jesus Christ. But may I say to you this morning, we need to make life God's cause. We need Listen to this. Look at me, church. Listen to what I say. We need to make our life, your life, God's cause. 
You see, we need to never sink into the selfish state for our own motive. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's not about me. It's about Him. It's not about this church. It's about the glory of God. It's not about us, but it's about winning people to Jesus Christ. We need to keep ourselves aiming for God's glory. In other words, everything that we do needs to be for His glory and His honor and His praise. We need to keep clean of sinful living. You and I need to, uh, to avoid the, the, the appearance of sin. The Word of God says abstain from the very appearance of evil. And we need to contend for the faith. Contend means to fight for the faith. Jude tells us in, in 1 3, he says, Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort or encourage you that you should earnestly, with everything that you have, is what that means, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. May I tell you this morning, faith was once delivered to you. You didn't always have faith. You didn't always have faith. Listen. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You are saved because Jesus loved you and died for you. You are saved because God sent to you His amazing grace. And He gave you the faith with which to believe. We need to live by faith. Paul writes to the church of Galatians and to us when he says this in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. I've given everything I have to Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Church of the redeemed, I'm going to tell you this morning that our life's lesson should be that I live by the faith of Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. I fight for him in the great fight of faith. I stand boldly before him. I live for him. I try to keep myself clean from sin. I want to give glory and honor to him. Why? Because, I, because he gave everything of, to, to me. He, God gave Jesus Christ heaven's best for me, earth's worst. And he came and saved me and redeemed me, moved in and took control. And I live not by my desires and not by my might, but because Holy Spirit lives within us by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Make our life a life of faith for the cause of Christ. After all, after all, can you not but trust Christ to fight your battles? You have nobody else to trust. Well, preacher, I think I can do it on my own. You'll go to hell. Well, preacher, I think I can overcome this. You'll be defeated. You want me to tell you why there's so many people living defeated lives? Because they haven't cast all their cares on Jesus. Wow. Wow. You want me to tell you why there's so many people living a defeated life? Because they haven't given everything of their life to Jesus. You want me to tell you why this church is not filled with people who say they're so-called believers? It's because they haven't been crucified with Christ. They've never committed everything that they have and everything they are and everything they ever will have and everything they ever will be to Jesus and live by His faith. Wow. You want me to tell you why people wake up in the morning and you go to a job tomorrow and somebody will be complaining about their life? Oh, they'll be there. You know they will. You hear them. It's because they haven't trusted in Jesus. Because they haven't given everything to Him. You know why people come to church one Sunday and miss two or three? It's because they haven't given everything to Jesus. Do you know why people are defeated? Because they haven't listened to what Christ says and Peter relates to us in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares on Him for He careth for you. May I tell you this morning, there's not anything about your life that He doesn't love and cares about. And then another lesson that we learn is not only that we live by faith and trust in Him, 
is that we don't forget that it is the Lord's cause. That it's the Lord's cause. If you ever bring yourself into it, it becomes your cause and not God's. It becomes your cause. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Deuteronomy 24. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Don't ever forget. It's the Lord's cause. It's the Lord's battle. He's victorious. Don't put yourself in it. Just put all you have in it. Don't make it a personal ambition. Make it the fact that it's God's cause that we're fighting for. You see, it's not for our glory, it's for His. It's not for our advancement, it's for His. It's not for our reputation, it's for His. It's not for us to make a name for ourselves, it's for His. It's not for Woodland Heights Free Will Baptist Church to make a name in the community. It's for the glory of God. It's for the salvation of souls. It's for the edification of the saints. It's for God and God alone. And listen to this. This is a beautiful lesson to learn. Since the battle is the Lord's, and we fight daily. We can be happy even if we're personally defeated. You see, every battle is not going to be a battle that we enjoy. And there's going to come times when we think that we are defeated. You know, you lose that job, you lose your insurance, somebody gets mad at you. Your kids hurt your feelings. Your husband and your wife say you're the problem. People don't like you. And you begin to say, I'm defeated. No, you're not. Why? Because Jesus Christ is still highly exalted. If we live by Him, we have victory. Oh, there may be momentary lapses in our life. But if we realize that we live for Him and the cause is His, we come out of every battle victorious. And because the battle is the Lord's, we don't need to get upset. We don't need to get def uh, and emotionally defeated. We don't need to worry. If, I'm going to say this, if Christians in this church, in our church, would quit worrying about everything in the world. Amen? And start praying, we'd see greater victories. If we would quit worrying about whether we're going to see a result from the work that we're doing, we'll have greater victories because the result is up to God. Psalmist says in Psalms 37, fret not, worry not, but pray. You see, God tells us in Isaiah 30, 15, for thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest ye shall be saved in the quietness and in the confidence shall, your, shall be your strength. God gives victory we just wait on it. We don't rush it. And we stand, fourthly, we, because this is the lesson we need to learn, because the battle is the Lord's. We stand. We stand. And having to done all to stand, we still stand. 